the longest reigning monarch in British history, Queen Elizabeth, spent 70 years on the throne and during that period fundamentally changed the royal family. She made and watched history as the head of the royal family for seven decades. Welcome to Best Wonders, where today we'll be showing you how Queen Elizabeth II transformed the British monarchy forever. But before we continue, be sure to like, subscribe, and click that notification bell so you get more videos like this. Now, let's move on to the video. The abdication issue of 1936, which was the pivotal royal incident of the 20th century, delayed the start of Elizabeth's reign. After the sudden abdication of Edward VIII, his shy, stuttering younger brother Albert became King George VI. Soon after, he was catapulted into the position of national leader during the Second World War. For his older daughter, Princess Elizabeth, the war served as the most formative experience. She may rightfully claim to have taken part in what has been referred to as the People's War because of her experience working as a car mechanic with the ATS or Auxiliary Territorial Duty, the Women's Army Service. She acquired a more innate common touch as a result of the encounter that any of her predecessors had. Her 1947 marriage to Philip Mountbatten, who later became the Duke of Edinburgh and passed away in April 2021 at the age of 99 was seen as a chance to uplift a country still suffering from the effects of post-war austerity and rationing. Elizabeth II inherited a monarchy whose influence in public life appeared to have increased despite the monarchy's political power having been slowly declining since the 18th century. In the 20th century, monarchs were expected to carry out their ceremonial obligations with the appropriate gravity as well as to loosen up sufficiently to share and appreciate the hobbies and tastes of the common people. Both of these functions were successfully balanced in the magnificent coronation of the Queen in 1953. She made the choice to enable it to be broadcasted on television, bringing the old ceremony, which had Saxon roots, into the living rooms of regular people using cutting-edge technology. Now that royal ceremonies would be democratically transparent, they would also, ironically, become more better choreographed and more formal than they had ever been. When the Queen agreed to the 1969 BBC film Royal Family at the request of Lord Mountbatten and his son-in-law, the television producer Lord Brayborn, she went on to revolutionize how the public perceived the monarchy. It was an incredible close-up depiction of her daily routine with scenes of her eating breakfast, enjoying a barbecue at Balmoral, and visiting the neighborhood stores. The Queen's decision to defy convention and mingle with the masses who had gathered to see her in Australia and New Zealand in 1970 came after then Prince Charles's investiture as Prince of Wales the same year, another royal televised event. Soon, these walkabouts were a staple of any royal visit. The 1977 Silver Jubilee celebrations, which saw the nation decked out in red, white, and blue at street parties modeled after V-Day, marked the pinnacle of the Queen's popularity during the middle of her reign. Although she kept party politics out of her official duties, Queen Elizabeth was always actively involved in politics. As the head of the Commonwealth, she served as a mediator in disputes between member states and offered support and advice to Commonwealth leaders, even those who were vehemently opposed to her own UK government. She was a strong supporter of the organization, even when her own prime ministers had long since lost faith in it. Her prime ministers have praised her political sageness and expertise. These came up as a result of her years of expertise as well as her careful reading of state paperwork. Harold Wilson once said that being unprepared for the weekly audience was like being caught not having finished your homework at school. She reportedly had a terrible time getting along with Margaret Thatcher. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh occasionally objected to how governments used them for political purposes. They didn't like being obliged by David Owen, the Foreign Secretary at the time, to host Nikolai Ceausescu and his wife at Buckingham Palace in 1978. The Queen frequently provided the ceremonial and public confirmation of the work of her ministers, which had a highly good impact on foreign relations. She developed strong bonds with several American presidents, especially Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama, and her successful state visit of the Republic of Ireland in 2011 
during which she stunned her hosts by speaking to them in Gaelic, remains a shining example of the beneficial effects that can result from such visits. She even managed to set aside her personal feelings regarding the assassination of Lord Mountbatten in 1979, enough to extend a warm welcome to Martin McGuinness, a former IRA commander, when he was appointed Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland in 2007. The Queen rarely and only briefly let her own political beliefs come to light. Her carefully worded request in 2014 that Scots consider their vote in the independence referendum was largely perceived as an intervention on the Union's behalf. Additionally, she was overheard complaining about the lack of political action on the climate change emergency in the lead-up to the 2021 UN COP26 meeting in Glasgow, which she had to withdraw from due to medical advice. In 2015, she surpassed her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria's 63 years of regal rule, to become the longest reigning monarch in British history. Elizabeth II, though, was the queen of a lot of other firsts. Her coronation ceremony in 1953 was the first to be broadcast on television and was seen by a record-breaking 27 million people in only the UK. When she greeted the public in 1970 while on tour in Sydney, her Majesty established the custom of her well-known royal walkabouts. The Queen visited over 100 nations on behalf of the Crown, making her the most traveled of all the British monarchs. In 1965, she made the first state visit to what was then West Germany. Then, 21 years later, in 1986, she traveled to China for the first time as a British Queen making it largely regarded as one of the most significant trips and a crucial act of diplomacy at the time. Additionally, she was the first to address America's 1991 Congress. The Queen declared that force, in the end, is sterile, and that we have gone better. Our societies based on mutual consent, on contract, and on consensus. She made history in May 2011 when she became the first British Queen to visit the Republic of Ireland in a century. A reigning monarch visited the Emerald Isle for the first time since it broke away from the United Kingdom. I think the Queen was trying to create an environment for an improvement in relations, said ABC News royal contributor Alistair Bruce. That moment when she came off the airplane in Ireland, the Republic, and came down the steps dressed in St. Patrick's blue and later on lowered her head at the memorial to those who had sought Republican success. The Queen at the time said, with the benefit of historical hindsight, we may all see things which we would wish had been done better or not at all. To all those who have suffered as a result of our troubled past, I express my heartfelt thoughts and deep condolences. Then, this past summer, Her Majesty celebrated a Platinum Jubilee, a four-day event marking 70 years on the throne, becoming the first British monarch to do so. As she approached her 10th decade, she finally started to slow down, giving more of her official responsibilities to other members of the royal family. In May 2022, she gave Charles the responsibility for performing her most significant ceremonial duty, reading the speech from the throne at the state opening of parliament. But she still had the capacity to handle a catastrophe. In direct contrast to her prime minister, the Queen spoke to the country from lockdown at Windsor in 2020 as the COVID virus spread. Her words were measured and serene. Her succinct speech incorporated confidence that, in a deliberate allusion to Vera Lynn's wartime anthem, we will meet again. She stood in unity with her people. Elizabeth II maintained the British monarchy by altering its outer image without alerting its position in public life. Republican opponents of the monarchy had long since given up calling for its immediate abolition and realized that their goal was impossible to achieve while the Queen was still alive due to her popularity. Elizabeth II, the longest reigning queen in British history with a 70-year reign, leaves her successor with the kind of British monarchical republic. With its constituent parts of mystery, ritual, populism, and openness continuously adjusted, yet remaining largely the same. Political figures and analysts from all over the world have long recognized that the Queen managed her frequently delicate and challenging constitutional job with grace and extraordinary political competence. She was universally regarded with a mixture of respect, adoration, awe, and affection that cut across nations, classes, 
and decades due to her wisdom and unwavering sense of responsibility. She had a great deal of pride in Britain and her people, but ultimately, she belonged to the world, and her death will be mourned by everyone. Which of these things did you know about the Queen? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel, and ring that notification bell for more of the world's best wonders.